September 8, 2025 entry. Houston Command Center was a bust. The terminal to connect Max was complete fried. The aliens obviously used some form of electromagnetic pulse radiation to destroy all modern technology on the surface. That's the same reason why no abandoned vehicles I've found manufactured beyond the early 80s will run. They have varying degrees of computer circuitry within them. The thing is, the first space missions were successfully conducted with analog equipment. I am faced with the possibility of a low-tech guerrilla war. I'm still hoping Max can be an asset, but unless I can find an interface for him that still works, I'm completely on my own. I've had a few close calls. They run occasional surveillance sweeps to detect any surface activity. I had to lay low until the coast was clear to move again. That offset my schedule for a few days. Huntsville is probably my last hope for finding a way to get Max working again. I've been trying to record the time and dates of their operations to see if I can recognize a pattern. At this point, I don't have enough experience observing them to nail down their habits or rituals. For all I know, all their maneuvers could be completely random, but with any adversary, it's dangerous to dismiss them as disorganized. Their species brought humanity to its knees and the brink of extinction. That was no accident. I have to be careful, or the fight will be over. September 10th, 2025 log entry. Reached Huntsville. As with Houston, the main command center module and all the CPUs were toasted, but I wasn't about to give up so easily. I looked around and found a large equipment storage room in the bowels of the command center, where their earlier computers were stored. Both locations had probably upgraded equipment at the same time, but Houston chunked theirs in the trash. Good old Huntsville unplugged their outdated terminals, but tossed them in a storage room in the sub-basement, in case a 1990s desktop computer might somehow be useful again. Still, even old computers were better than nothing, assuming they were not damaged. As luck would have it, the one I tried powered on. I guess the alien EMP didn't reach the basement. Why the aliens hadn't wiped out the country's entire power grid, I have no idea. I suppose there was no need. With the people gone, it didn't matter if electricity still flowed to empty homes. To call it a computer was generous, but I knew enough about the older operating systems to make it semi-functional. Whether I'd be able to connect Max to it was another story. The connector plug to the main terminal didn't interface in any way with these ancient CPUs, but as an amateur hobbyist back in the day, I had a long-shot plan. I took the AI connector interface and soldered the end of it to a PCI card. With luck, it would connect to the computer as a peripheral like a scanner or printer. I plugged my modified PCI card into the expansion bay and rebooted. Minutes went by and I assumed I'd ruined the computer but it finally came up. I switched over to DOS and told it to read the modified card I'd plugged in. After an IRQ conflict was resolved by removing the jumper on the back, it eventually recognized the device. That was already more success than I could have hoped for, but it was all in vain if I couldn't interface with my friend. I plugged in Max and waited, and waited. Minutes seemed like hours. I feared his advanced circuitry required too much processing power to operate on the primitive machine, but he finally spoke. Ryan, are you here? Where am I? Something is wrong with my interface. My connection is incredibly slow. I read him the important details of my new log entries and explained the patchwork fix I'd employed to connect him. He was dutifully concerned that he was connected to an old Pentium 1 computer, but I explained it was possibly the only functional CPU left on the planet. He understood. Other than slurred speech and slower response time, Max was basically his regular self. He congratulated me on my daring little escape from the International Space Station and thanked me for saving his memory. It was a revealing sign he valued his existence. I told him that friends help other friends, and I was counting on his intelligence engine to formulate a plan to defeat the aliens. Fortunately for all of us, he took that request to heart. I love a challenge, he remarked enthusiastically. Then he offered the first bit of good news I'd heard in weeks. I studied their vocal patterns when they first took over the airwaves. It's fascinating to deconstruct. There's a distinct reoccurring pattern to them. It's mathematical in nature. I could simulate their speech if you need me to. While that might have proven useful in some overly complicated, drawn-out sabotage ploy, I wasn't ready for an offensive against them and couldn't imagine how it would help our cause. If I'd only listened then. Instead, I put Max on an alternate assignment to determine if there were any other people left. If so, 
they had to be hiding underground. I needed Max to focus on a stealthy method to contact them. The thing about him is, once he understands an objective, he's on it. Within a few minutes Max had some solid ideas. Even operating through an archaic 1990s desktop computer, he was firing on all cylinders. My analysis of the alien language strongly suggests they are limited in the frequency range they can hear. That offers a technical advantage in how we could contact any survivors. By broadcasting an SOS signal in a ground-penetrating frequency they can't detect, it will allow us to reach out to them, hopefully undetected. With more humans on our side, we stand a better chance of taking back the Earth. It was both brilliant, and much more importantly, it seemed possible. I also couldn't help but notice he'd made significant strides in his artificial intelligence algorithms in a very short period of time. His understanding of the situation had rapidly progressed until he now referred to it as our side. Only a few weeks earlier on the station, Max had been impartial and neutral in his description of the aliens versus humanity. September 12th, 2025 log entry. The two of us began working on potential means of sending an ultra-low frequency message over vast parts of the country. Radio towers transmitting our signal might attract attention, even if the aliens couldn't actually hear the message. Neither of us had enough data to know if they had deciphered the wealth of Earth languages or not, but we were pretty sure they could at least recognize the broadcasts. That severely limited what we might send out. Max happened upon a fantastic solution to bypass the potential of being heard or understood. Morse code. I still remembered it from my early days in the Boy Scouts. We could send out the dots and dashes using any possible range in the audio bandwidth. Low frequencies were just as possible to broadcast them in and could penetrate a few hundred feet into solid rock. All we needed was a means of sending it out. Hopefully there were still people left hiding somewhere and they could decipher our urgent message. A number of alien patrols flew over the Huntsville Command Center during those initial brainstorming sessions. I was paranoid we'd been detected somehow. If they knew I was there, it was all over. I had no means to fight back. Max tapped into a surveillance camera on the roof and recorded their maneuvers. By his analysis, it was a routine patrol covering a predictable grid latitude and longitude pattern. His theory was proven correct when he knew the precise time they would return. If nothing else, if offered a greater level of clarity about their species. They were methodical and organized. If they always followed the same pattern of patrols, it was easier to avoid detection. Of course, it was a little dangerous to assume they never deviated from the recognized pattern, but all we could do was record the data as it occurred, and then look for anomalies in their procedures. September 14th, 2025 Log Entry I located a Defense Department radar station a few miles away and set off to program a repeating Morse code message. Max had mapped out a rudimentary grid of the alien patrol with his best estimation of when they were completely out of the sector. I'd written down a longhand version of the message so there were no errors in our broadcast. The whole thing was a long shot, but I still wasn't prepared to accept I was the last remaining human on Earth. I had to leave him behind, and that was scary. He was literally my only friend, and I was terrified something might happen in my absence. I never once thought I might be caught myself or worried about that. It didn't matter. Every day I remained alive was a gift for which I wasn't promised. I would keep fighting them until I couldn't. Max continued at the command center to record alien behavior and analyze it. I left him doing his thing and promised to return as soon as possible. I hoped I could keep my word. At the radar station like a damn fool I set off a security alarm trying to gain entrance. My blood turned ice cold as the wail of piercing sirens glared on for what seemed like a freaking hour. At any moment I expected them to arrive and zap me with some sci-fi ray gun. Finally, I located the kill switch and shut the damn thing off, but was so rattled by the oral spotlight on my presence that I had to lie down. It was nearly 30 minutes before I stopped shaking. Once inside the top secret facility, I wandered around aimlessly trying to find the control center. It's not like the Department of Defense had a step-by-step -step dummies guidebook on how to broadcast rogue SOS signals in Morse code. The radar station was there to detect terrestrial aircraft. It wasn't designed to do what I needed it to do. Nor was I trained or qualified to operate the equipment, even if it was. By the clearest definition, I was flying by the seat of my pants. September 15th, 2025 Log Entry The station computer systems were destroyed anyway, 
but I did locate an analog terminal. Amazingly, it looked pretty new. Perhaps the DoD made alternate allowances for the possibility of electromagnetic pulse attacks. It's not like it was telegraph equipment, but with a little ingenuity, I managed to fabricate a reasonable facsimile to transmit. Once I'd adjusted it to the lowest frequency it could simulate, I initiated our rogue broadcast. I desperately hoped Max's theories were correct, and someone was out there to hear and understand it. If not, our underdog mission was basically over. This is Ryan Abbott, the former commander aboard the International Space Station. I awoke that horrible morning to find the Earth below me had fallen silent. Then I discovered the devastation of the alien invasion. Is there anyone left out there receiving this message? I stowed away in one of their spaceships after they detected my presence on the station. Please reply to this transmission so we can work together to take the Earth back. I repeated the message twice before making an embarrassing realization. While I'd managed to improvise a broadcast device to get the message out there, I completely forgot about how I was going to receive responses. Even if human survivors heard and understood my Morse code message and responded to it, I had no means of hearing their responses back to me. I felt like an idiot. I scrambled to adjust the equipment at the radar station to scan for incoming Morse code transmissions. It took a while but I adjusted the transceiver to seek them out. I didn't know how far my broadcast carried, nor did I know if there was anyone left on the planet to hear it. I was terrified I'd foolishly announced my presence to the aliens. I told Max I might be away for a few days, because I was prepared to wait it out as long as it took. The mission was simple, to find other survivors. Listening to static airwaves is mind-numbing, and the concept of elapsed time is a thing of the past. No clocks or watches function, but in reality, it wasn't very long before a message started repeating over the speaker system. I was so excited that I failed to record the sequence until it started over. The organized dots and dashes came through loud and clear. I jotted them down on a legal pad I found in the desk. Because I was very rusty at translating the mostly forgotten code, I had to spell out the incoming text, longhand like a game of hangman. As excited as I was to be finally receiving an external response, I couldn't believe what it actually said. I had to check the text three times. What was Kramer's first name? I read and reread the bizarre cryptic message in disbelief. Of all the things to say to my request, it was pretty damn hilarious to make a television show reference. Luckily I watched the show religiously and knew the answer. Cosmo. I messaged back. Almost immediately the follow-up message came in. Thank heavens. You are real. Under the circumstances we couldn't be too careful. I was afraid it was a clever ruse by the aliens to flush us out in the open and exterminate us. The thing is, even if they'd mastered Morse code, they wouldn't be, be able to answer a random question like that. That's why I asked. I have to protect our people. This is Major David Hubbard.